Okay, good evening to everyone and thank you for uh, joining in. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I put here uh, uh, in the chat box a link to the source pages if anybody that will be using tonight, I'll also be sharing them on the screen. But if anybody wants to download a copy, uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, so I'll just uh, do a brief summary of what we spoke about last week and then, and then we'll move on. So basically we tried to analyze um, who was Yeshayahu, what period did he prophesize? And we mentioned that the first pasuk in, in Sefer Yeshayahu mentions that Yeshayahu uh, prophesized for quite a long period of time, sp uh, spanning across four kings of Yehuda. That was his main area of prophecy. And uh, at those times, Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Yehuda and the kingdom of Israel. So Yeshayahu was based in the kingdom of Yehuda, which is Yerushalayim and the vicinity of Yerushalayim going down south. And he, he prophesied from, through four kings, it mentions, Uziyahu, Yotam, Achaz, and uh, Chizkiyahu. We're talking about uh, approximately 8th century uh, BCE. Um, now, we mentioned that uh, Chazal uh, explained to us and, um, that Yeshayahu was from the royal family. In other words, Yeshayahu was the son of Amos. His father was also a prophet. And we'll, uh, in the coming weeks, we'll see that we even have a prophecy in the Tanakh from Yeshayahu's father, Amos. So he, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, so to speak, new to prophecy. It, it was something that went in the family. And in addition, Amos was the brother of Amatziah, who was the king also of Yehuda before Uziah. So essentially, Uziyahu, who was the first king that Yeshayahu prophesied in the time, was a cousin of Yeshayahu. In other words, Yeshayahu was a prince. Uh, he was from the, uh, the royal family. And um, obviously, that's, uh, uh, that's something uh, uh, quite uh, significant. So, uh, uh, because, again, if you're a, you're a prophet, you're trying to speak to people, you want them to listen to you, you're probably saying things that they're not interested in hearing. And especially, a lot of times, prophets are speaking to kings. Uh, and the kings are definitely not, usually not happy with what a prophet has to tell them. So if it's somebody who has some standing, he's the son of a prophet, he's from the royal family, then that should at least give him a way into the door and you know, uh, allow him to make himself uh, heard uh, much better. Another thing that we pointed out, that Yeshayahu had another connection to the royal family, and that is, according to the tradition of Chazam, um, at some point, Chizkiyahu, who again, was the fourth king uh, that, Yesha that uh, Yeshayahu prophesied in his time. In other words, at that point, probably Yeshayahu was older and Chizkiyahu was younger, but Chizkiyahu married the daughter of Yeshayahu. Uh, we tried to prove that as well from the Psukim, the daughter of Yeshayahu, uh, Cheftiba, and they bore a, a son, Menashe, who was the king after um, Chizkiyahu. He was a very wicked king, but still, we see here another connection of Yeshayahu uh, to the royal family. In other words, that his daughter married the king, and essentially the next king, Menashe, was, was his grandson. Uh, Rabbi Levi, after last week's year, he pointed out that if you look at um, uh, Michelangelo's, uh, uh, Michelangelo uh, uh, depicted a lot of the prophets in the Sistine Chapel. <clears throat> so his depiction of Yeshayahu there, you can Google it online and see it shows Yeshayahu as being very regal. So that sort of fits in uh, with what we said, that Yeshayahu was from uh, uh, the royal family. So we even have a little bit of support from uh, uh, Michelangelo for, for that analysis. Okay, so now today we'll, we'll continue um, and, and try to see, first of all, uh, the structure of the book of Yeshayahu, sort of a general structure. And then we'll start to go in to the first prophecy of Yeshayahu, Yeshayahu's uh, consecration as a prophet, and we'll see that that came out at a, 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 um, appeared at a very uh, interesting uh, point in um, in Jewish history. Okay, so I'll share you the source pages. Now, generally, uh, we should know that Chazan have a principle which is called Ein Mukdamu Muhar Torah, which means that the Torah, and not just the Torah itself, but also all the prophets, are not necessarily written in chronological order. And we can see that quite clearly from many cases, both in the Torah and in other books in Tanakh, that often events are not recorded 
in chronological order. Uh, nevertheless, Yeshayahu is not completely in chronological order, but we will see that there is, there is somewhat of a sense of chronological order uh, to Yeshayahu. Okay, and that, that sort of will shed a bit of light on the structure of the book on, of Yeshayahu. So I'll share with you uh, the source pages. Okay, so let's take a look. So first of all, as we mentioned, uh, the first pasuk in Yeshayahu who mentions that Yeshayahu prophesies during the foreign kings, Uziyahu, Yotam, Achazi, Chizkiyahu, all kings, Malchei Yehuda, all kings of the kingdom of Yehuda. Now, if we look, scroll through just dates that are mentioned in the book of Yeshayahu, we'll get a sense, there aren't a lot of date men, date, dates mentioned, but there are a few, and we'll get a sense that there is a certain chronological order to Yeshayahu. So, for example, I just listed here um, four dates that do appear in the book of Yeshayahu. The first one appears in chapter 6, and chapter 6 is actually, the, as we'll see, the first prophecy of Yeshayahu. Again, this is not completely chronological, even though you would expect the first prophecy in Yeshayahu to appear in chapter 1. It does not. It only appears in chapter 6, and at some point we'll discuss why that's so. But nevertheless, that's, that, as we'll soon see, is the first prophecy of Yeshayahu. And the date given for that is Bishnat Mot HaMelech Uziyahu, the, the year that Uziyahu died. Okay, as we'll soon learn, it doesn't exactly mean that he died, but, there's a, but this is a very significant year. So this is the first year that's mentioned, first date that's given in the book of Yeshayahu. The next date which is given in the following chapter, in chapter seven, this is in source number three, is yotam ben melech ala melech aram ben melech yisrael yerushalayim So the next date that appears in the book of Yeshayahu skips to the time of Achaz. Again, always keep in mind our list. Our list is Uziyahu, then Yotam, Achaz and Chizkiyahu. So we have, uh, we sort of are now skipping from the year that Uziyahu died. We're skipping over Yotam and going straight to the following king, the third king, which is Achaz. And this is during um, when Achaz was ruling and two nations, Aram and Israel. Um, Aram is up where what we call Syria nowadays. And the kingdom of Israel was also north in Israel, but north to the kingdom of Judah, and they both uh, went to war against uh, Ahaz, the king of Yehuda. Okay, so that's the next date we have. So interestingly, sort of at least the dates seem to skip Yotam. Okay, we, we sort of skip from Uziyahu's death till Ahaz. Again, the next date that we have appears in chapter 14, source number four. In other words, a certain prophecy of Yeshayahu, which is dated to the year of Ahaz's passing away. And the fourth date that we have in the book of Yeshayahu appears now in chapter 36. We have a total of 66 chapters in Yeshayahu, just to give you perspective. So in chapter 36, uh, we have the date of so this we're talking about the 14th year of Chizkiyahu. So we've had the year that Uziyahu passed away. Then we had the year, a certain year within the ruling time of Ahaz, the year that Ahaz died, and now the 14th year of Chizkiyahu, where there was again a very significant event that Sancherib, the king, the, the king of Assyria, uh, placed a siege on uh, on uh, Yerusha, uh, he, he, he captured a lot of uh, towns in Yehuda and, all, and also tried unsuccessfully uh, to capture Yerushalayim. Okay, so just looking at the dates that we have in Yeshaya, we sort of get a chronological feeling to the book because all the dates, at least that do appear explicitly, uh, appear in chronological order. We have from Uziyahu, Ahaz, skipping a bit, uh, skipping a lot of years in between, but Uziyahu, then Ahaz, Ahaz's death, and something during the uh, 14th year of, of the ruling of uh, Chizkiyahu. Now, my father-in-law, uh, Rav Yosef Carmel, he, as I mentioned last week, he wrote a book called uh, Tsofnat Yeshayahu, translated to English as The Secrets of Isaiah. 
and a little bit based on these dates, but also on textual analysis of all the chapters, he uh, drew up a structure to the book of uh, Yeshayahu, and his structure comes out as follows. And actually, it is presented in chronological order. Uh, again, this won't mean to us much at this stage, but as we go more in depth into these chapters, this will become more meaningful. So his analysis is as follows. The chapters one through six took place are prophecies that belong to the period of Uziah, when Uziah was ruling. Chapters seven through 12 um, are from the time of Ahaz, because again, we have dates from Ahaz in these chapters. Chapters 13 to 23 are sort of a unit onto their own, because these are all a series of prophecies that all opened up with the term Masa. Masa literally means a burden or a load, but in the context of a prophecy, it sort of means a sort of uh, proclamation, pronouncement that uh, the prophet is trying to say, and it's, it's sort of termed for some reason as a Masa. And those prophecies, with the except of one of them, all of them are on na different nations uh, of the, uh, that existed at those times, and Yeshayahu prophesizes on each one of those nations. So that's sort of a unit onto its own within the book. It's not, because it's not addressing the events of so much of the kingdom of Yehuda, it's sort of mostly uh, global prophecies. Then we have chapters 24 to 39, which is uh, from the days of Chizkiyahu. And as we know, some of those chapters within that unit explicitly address events that occurred during Chizkiyahu. And this, I think, is one of the most interesting points in his analysis. Again, we, we're not going to study it now. I'm just throwing it out there, that he claims that from chapter 40 till chapter 66 are prophecies from the time of Menashe. Okay, now this is a bit of a radical claim. I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, as we mentioned, in the, the title head to the book of Yeshayahu, only four kings are mentioned. Uziyahu, Yotam, Achaz, and Chizkiyahu. It doesn't mention that Yeshayahu prophesied uh, during the times of Menashe. So we could answer, even though he did perhaps prophesy in the time of Menashe, nevertheless, it, the Navi did not want to mention that explicitly because, as we know, Menashe was considered the most wicked king of all the kings of Yehuda, so perhaps that's why his name was mentioned explicitly. What's very interesting about this is that this is something that's commonly known, that from chapter 40 in Yeshayahu till the end of the book, the whole style of the book radically changes. And it changes so much that some uh, critics of, the, of, of Tanakh have claimed that actually the, the author of and the prophet from chapter 40 onwards is not the same as the first uh, 39 chapters. And they claim that there were two prophets under the name of Yeshayahu. And really, this is sort of a separate book from a separate prophet that was lumped together uh, into one book. Um, because the, the, the style of change and the contents is so radical uh, from chapter 40 onwards. And this is something that's uh, been heavily debated. There's even a famous book, Echadaya Yeshayahu. One was Yeshayahu trying to counter uh, this whole claim. So my father-in-law, Rav Carmel, his suggestion uh, to try to resolve this, and this is something that he tries to prove as well, that these are prophecies from the times of Menashe, and Yeshayahu's visions radically changed during those periods due to uh, the unique circumstances uh, that came about during that, that period, and that's, that's the explanation for that sort of unique set of prophecies from uh, uh, chapter uh, 40 onwards. We're actually uh, familiar, a lot of those the prophecies are quite famous because uh, we read them, many of the haftarot that we read uh, during the year are actually taken from those unit of chapters from uh, chapter 40 onwards, Shabbat Nachamu, the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av, and the, the, the following uh, six Shabbatot afterwards are all prophecies taken from uh, those chapters in Yeshaya. Okay, so that's regarding the structure of the book of Yeshayahu. So that sort of gives us a sort of a chronological uh, view of the book. And it will help us because as we spoke about last time, it's very important to contextualize each, each prophecy. If you want to understand the prophecy, you have to understand to what events it was relating, what was the political, economical, cultural framework of that specific prophecy. And based on that, uh, we, it will give us much more depth and meaning uh, to, to the specific prophecies of Yeshayahu, and by sort of pinpointing that, oh, this is from the time of Uziyahu, 
we can learn a lot because with Yao we have a lot of information on what occurred during his time. Um, um, okay, so I was asked here, how long did he live the prophecy for five kings? Um, I didn't, I, I, I don't remember the exact calculation of the years, but I would say it would take about approximately uh, 50 years. I mean, it's a little difficult to calculate the years of these kings, but let's say each one of them approximately was about uh, 15, 20 years. So he could, if he was starting from the end of Uziel, then maybe, maybe I'm, I'm guessing a rough estimate of 50 years of prophesizing. Okay, it may be longer. Well, at some point we'll get a little bit into the calculations because calculating the years of these kings is very difficult uh, and there are a lot of contradictions within the Tanakh regarding their years and, and uh, it's a bit of a challenge to do, but a worth, uh, worthwhile exercise. Okay, so let's now go into the first prophecy of Yeshayahu, his consecration. And the reason I say consecration is because we find by many prophets that there is sort of a, their first, a lot, for a lot of them, we do have sort of their first prophecy, their first revelation, where Hashem appoints them to be a prophet. Like, for example, we know by Moshe, very famously, the burning bush. That was his first prophecy. That was the first time that God revealed himself to him. And he said, I want to send you as a prophet. And a lot of times the prophets are not very agreeable to do so. Like, for example, Moshe tried every possible way to get out of the mission, but uh, he was forced into it. Uh, we know of other prophets that have tried to avoid being pro prophets. As we'll see, Yeshayahu was actually uh, quite uh, ready and enthusiastic for the task. Okay, so without, without further ado, let's see this. Okay, so this is, appears, it doesn't appear in the first chapter of the book, interestingly, it appears in the sixth chapter of Yeshayahu. And again, we're, we're later going to analyze this chapter in much more detail, but I just want to see at first glance that this was indeed uh, his consecration <clears throat> and try to get a bit of understanding of when this took place. Okay, so it says in, in the first uh, uh, verse in chapter six, it says, Bishnat mot ha-melech uziyahu, Okay, so where are we located? This is the year that King Uziah died. And Yeshayahu says that he saw God seated on a high and lofty throne and the skirts of his robe filled the temple. Okay, so generally this is a description of the Seraphim which are a type of angels, and he, see that, he sees that each of these angels has six wings, two wings to cover the face, two wings to cover the legs, and two wings to fly with. And he heard these angels, these Rafim, singing out, holy, 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 <coughs> the Lord of hosts, his presence fills all the earth. And this, as we know, the Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh Hashem Tzvot, this is a, a major, um, a major focal point of our tefillot, of our of our prayers. That in the kedusha, which is one of the highlights of our prayers, we use we sort of try to um, follow in in the spirit of the angels, and also use this uh, same singing and praising that Yeshayahu uh, heard them uh, uh, sing. Now, in verse number four, we come to something very interesting, and it says, "Vayanu amot hasipim." Okay, so what happened here was that he sees that the doorposts would shake at the sound of the one who called and the house kept filling with smoke. So he's seeing here the doorposts shaking. When do normally doorposts shake? If you're in your home and all of a sudden you see the doorposts shaking, what, what do you assume is happening? Um, so I, I hope this doesn't... An earthquake. An earthquake, exactly. I hope this doesn't occur much uh, in, in London, but um, uh, it, it is an earthquake, and we'll see that actually uh, during the times of Uziyahu, there was a very, very significant earthquake. And apparently, and this is what we'll see how Chazal explain what is going on here, that Yeshayahu is receiving this prophecy at the moment of that earthquake that occurs in the times of Uziyahu. And that earthquake is also a very significant event. Okay. Now he says, I'm in Pasuke now, 
ואומר אוי לי כי נדמיתי, כי איש תמא שפתיים אנוכי, ובתוך עם תמא שפתיים אנוכי יושב, כי את המלך אדוני צבאות ראו עיניי. So now Yeshayahu cries, cries out, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips, yet my own eyes have beheld the King Lord of hosts. In other words, he sort of, when he sees this revelation of God, then he, he sort of understands his own impurity, his own uncleanliness, and that's his response. And now what happens? In verse 6, so now one of these angels, these seraphs, one of these angels comes and take a, takes a coal from the altar and he's taking it with a pair of tongs. And what did he do with this coal? In verse 7, So he says, he touched it to my lips and declared, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt shall depart and your sin be purged away. So in essence, Yeshayahu is sort of now being consecrated to be a prophet. How so? By this burning coal from the altar, it's being put on his lips and that purifies him. And now, even though his, he, he felt his mouth was impure, his lips were not clean, now they've been purified and now he can go ahead and speak the words of God to the people. Okay, and this is what it says. Uh, in the next verse, Vaishma et kol Adonai omer, et mi eshlach u mi elech lano, vaomar hinen ishlacheni. So he says, Then I heard the voice of my Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Okay, so Yeshayahu now hears that God is looking for a volunteer to be the prophet, and he hears his calling, and he says, I will be the one, go out and send me. And what's the response of God in the next pasuk? In other words, and he said, go say to the people, and then Yeshayahu gets his first message uh, um, to go ahead and speak to the people. So we see very clearly that we have here really, this chapter six is really describing uh, Yeshayahu's dedication, his consecration as a prophet. He goes, he, he sees this vision, he undergoes this sort of purification of his mouth. He hears God calling out for a volunteer to go and speak to the people. He volunteers for it. And then immediately he's sent out. So this is really uh, the first prophecy of Yeshayahu. Now, again, we're trying to contextualize. So when precisely did this occur? So we said it occurs, um, uh, interesting. Moshe also had an episode with the coal. Uh, correct. The episode with the coal uh, with, with, uh, with Moshe is interesting, according to the Midrash. Uh, the whole story that Pharaoh was trying to see if he was a clever boy or not, and he took the coals and touched it to his mouth, and that's why he became, had an impediment of speech, and then God said, I will put the words in your mouth. So you're right, Moshe also had this sort of idea that God is sort of taking over his mouth, and he's now becoming sort of the, uh, the, the messenger to speak the words of God. Okay, and Yeshayahu we see also has here uh, an interesting event with the coal. Uh, very, very good point. Okay. Now, let's, let's a bit analyze what exactly is this year that Uziyahu died. So let's see how Chazal interpret it. What is the year that Uziyahu died? So Chazal tell us in source number eight, uh, first of all, they point out, as we said, in source number eight, uh, they say, in other words, they're pointing out that really chapter six is really the first prophecy of Yeshayahu. Why, why isn't it chapter one? Because of Ein Mukadamu Mukhar Batura, the Torah is not necessarily written in a chronological order. So even though chapter six is the first prophecy, it wasn't placed first. It was only placed later on in chapter six. I think, as we'll learn at some point, that there is a reason why it was sort of delayed for chapter six and the first uh, five. Uh, chapters were quoted first, even though Yeshayahu probably prophesies them later on. Uh, there is a logic why uh, here the, the prophecies were written not in the chronological order. Again, as we said, the majority of the book was chronological, but within the chapters, within these six chapters that relate to the period of Uziah, they themselves are not in chronological order, and chapter six is really chronologically the first prophecy of Yeshayahu. 
But there is a reason why it was only presented in chapter six, which I hope we'll get to at some point. Now, we want to pinpoint, we said that this prophecy of Yeshayahu occurred, Bishnat Mota Melech Uziyahu. What is that year that Uziyahu died? So Chazal tell us the following in source number nine. This is in the Midrash Tanhuma, And they say as follows, In other words, four are living, but scripture calls them dead. The Eluhin, what are they? Ha'evion, ha'mitzora, va'iver u'mi she'en lo banim. The four are uh, the destitute, somebody who's very poor, the mitzora, one who has leprosy, a skin disease, then ha'iver, somebody who's blind, and mi she'en lo banim, one who has no children. Okay, now the one that we're interested in is the mitzora, the one with leprosy. What's the source that somebody who has leprosy is considered dead, in other words, what they're saying is as follows, that the year that Uziyahu died is not the year that he died, but rather it's the year that he became a mitzora, that he became a leper, that he received leprosy, which we'll see when that, that's an event that that the Tanakh speaks of, and that's the year. That's the year that it's referring to. It's not the year that he actually died and was buried, but rather it's the year that he became a leper because from that year, it's he's considered to be dead. Okay. Now one more point before we go on. Vayanua uh, motasipim. Again, this is the shaking of the doorposts, which is described in chapter six. So here. Ra'ash in Tanakh is an earthquake. And in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, it's mentioned that there was an earthquake during the times of Uziyahu. And this is when Yeshayahu received this prophecy. Okay, so now we have two events that occurred at the time when Yeshayahu received his first prophecy. A, Uziyahu became a leper. He was inflicted with leprosy. Second event that occurred on that day was that was the day of the earthquake. Okay, so in other words, we already have two, two events occurring at the time that Yeshayahu was receiving his first prophecy. The king is, has been inflicted with leprosy, and from that moment, he's considered to be dead. Second event is that there is an earthquake. Okay, so something, something is going on here. So now to try to understand this a little bit more, let's go to the story of when Uziyahu received leprosy. Okay, so we are now jumping to source number 10. This is in Divrei Hayamim Bet Chapter 26. In other words, in the book of Chronicles, the second book of Chronicles in chapter 26, this is where uh, this story appears. It's mentioned very, very briefly in the book of Melachim, in the book of Kings, but in the book of Kings, it just says that there was such an event without giving any details on it. Here in Divrei Amim, in the book of Chronicles, we have the exact details of everything that occurred. Okay, so we'll try to read through it quickly and get to the point of when Uziyahu uh, received leprosy and why, why that happened. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll try to read through it uh, quickly in English. Verse number one, uh, then all the people of Judah took Uziyahu, who was 16 years old, and proclaimed him to succeed his father, Amatziah. Okay, so Uziyahu, Amatziah, he had a whole story how tragically he died. Uh, so after uh, he passed away or was removed from his kingship, that's another interesting question, what exactly happened with his father. Uziyahu, at the age of 16, was an anointed king. It was he who rebuilt Eilat, which is Eilat, what we know Eilat nowadays in the south point of Israel, and restored it to Judah after King Amatziah slept with his fathers, in other words, that he died. So very interestingly, Uziyahu is now able to expand his kingdom all the way down south to Eilat. Okay, this is a very significant event. And it shows that Uziyahu was a successful king, uh, as we'll soon see. And we'll study this chapter uh, in somewhat more detail, but I, I just want to sort of 
uh, skim through it to get to the point of the leprosy. Okay, so it says Uziah was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. This number 52 is very problematic. Um, his mother's name was Yehoriah of Yerushalayim. He did what was pleasing to the Lord just as his father Amaziah has done. So Uziah was a good king. He was a righteous king. He applied himself to the worship of God during the time of Zechariah in structures and the visions of God. During the time he worshiped the Lord, God made him prosper. In other words, so Uziah had a prophet, Zechariah, who was instructing him and teaching him what to do, and he was worshiping the Lord. And it says during the time that he worshiped God, God made him prosper. But we can see from here that apparently there was at some point where he was not worshiping Hashem, and then he no longer prospered. But at first, Uziah was very successful. He went forth to fight the Philistines and breach the wall of Gath and the wall of Yavne and the wall of Ashdod. He built towns in the region of Ashdod and amongst the Philistines. In other words, Uziah was winning wars against the Philistines. The Philistines, they were very, very difficult. And most of the times of the kingdom of, of Judah, nobody was able to win against them. And Uziah was quite unique. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabs who lived in Guban and the uh, and, and Meunites, the Ammonim. The Ammonites paid tribute to Uziah, and his fame spread to the approaches of Egypt, for he grew extremely strong. Uziah built towers in Jerusalem on the corner gate and the valley gate and on the angle and fortified them. He built towers in the wilderness and hooed out many cisterns, for he had much cattle and farmers in the foothills and on the plain, and vine dressers in the mountains and on fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Okay, so we see a tremendous king, a king who's tremendously successful. He's winning wars. He's uh, branching out politically. Economically, he's very successful. He has both uh, agriculture and he's, he's controlling uh, the, the, um, the, com the, the commercial uh, um, uh, um, roads. Okay, it says Uziah had an army of warriors, a battle ready force who were mustered by Yechiel HaSofer and Maasiyah, the adjutant under Hananiah. Okay, and we see here he has an army of over 300,000 uh, people. He's providing them um, with all kinds of weapons. It even says here in verse number 10, he made clever devices in Yerushalayim, set on towers in the corners for shooting arrows and large stones. So he's, he's even advanced on military technology for that time. And now what happens? Where does the downfall come? So in what happened, in verse number 16, it says, when he, was, when he was strong, he grew so arrogant, he acted corruptly. Here's the downfall. After all this success, now comes the downfall of Uziah. And what happened? He trespassed against his God by entering the temple of the Lord to offer incest on the incest altar. In other words, what's happening here? This is sort of the age-old story that we have already in the Torah of Korach. If you remember, what was Korach's claim against Moshe and Aaron? That he also wants to be a Kohen. He also wants to be a priest and serve in the temple and offer the Ketoret, the incest. And we know what happened with Korach when he tried to do it. He was swallowed by what? The ground swallowed him. We had an earthquake then. And the people who were with him, they were burnt. And now Uziah was making the same mistake. And he also wants to serve as a Kohen in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple, and to offer the Torah, the incense. Okay? So the priests tried to warn him. The Kohanim, the priest Azariah, with 80 other brave priests of the Lord, follow him in. And confronting King Uziah said to him, it's not for you, Uziah, to offer incense to the Lord, but for the Aaronite priests. In other words, only the descendants of Aharon Kohen. They're the only ones that are Kohanim. Only they are allowed to offer the incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. There will be no glory in it from you, the, for you from the Lord God. In other words, it, this is unbelievable. They're standing up to the king, this very powerful king, and they're trying to stop him, but unfortunately they were not successful. Uziah, holding the censer and ready to burn incest, got angry. But as he got angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in front of the priests in the house of the Lord, besides the incest altar. Okay, so this is the point where Uziah receives his leprosy. When he was in the Beit HaMikdash, about to offer the incense, and again, he's not allowed to do that, despite him being king. He's not a Kohen. He's not a priest. Only the Kohanim, the descendants of Aaron, a Kohen, 
are allowed to enter and to, to offer sacrifices and, and the ktorit, um, the incest, which is considered sort of the highest, uh, most valuable um, uh, sacrifice that we have in the temple. So, and now leprosy breaks out on his forehead. When the chief priest, Azariah, and all other priests looked at him, his forehead was leprous. So they rushed him out of there. He too made haste to get out where the Lord had struck him with the plague. So Uziyahu at this point now is cooperating. He now realizes his mistake. He realized that he's been punished by God, that, he's, that he was wrong and he's received leprosy and he's not fighting anymore and he's leaving out willfully. And now what was the result? King Uziah was a leper until the day of his death. He lived in isolated quarters as a leper for he was cut off from the house of the Lord while Yotam, his son, was in charge of the king's house and governed the people of the land. So from this point on, Uziah is no longer functioning as a king. He's still alive technically, but he's living in isolation. He's not functioning as the king. Now his son has become the de facto king. He is, the son is ruling, and Uziah, for all purposes, is dead. Okay, and this is why Chazal said that the year that Uziah died is not referring to when Uziah actually died, but rather when Uziah really died in the sense of when he stopped functioning as a king, when he stopped functioning in this world. Because once he received this leprosy, that's it. For You know, technically he was still alive. He was eating, drinking, and sleeping. But for all purposes, his career was over. He was finished. He was dead. That's it. He no longer had contact with people. He was living in isolation as a leper. Nobody can get close to him. He's no longer functioning as king. As far as, as far as the nation of Israel is concerned, he is dead, and they've moved on to the next king, his son, Yotam, who's now de, de facto ruler. Okay? So what we have here, and this is, this is very important, this is when Yeshayahu is starting to prophesy. In other words, we have here a situation with a very, very successful king, a king who's incredibly successful. He's winning wars. He's conquering lands. He's expanding the territories of his kingdom, his Judah. He's advanced, he has military technology. He has other nations subdued to him and giving taxes. He has connections, political connections. He becomes very famous across the world. And at this point in juncture, after all this success, he, the arrogance gets to him. He tries to outstep his bounds as king and tries to also serve as a priest, as a Kohen and the Beit HaMikdash. And we, we have to think about, you know, what, 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 what was he thinking? But that's what he's trying, he's trying to do, because again, this wasn't a wicked person. This was a righteous king, at least in, in his, all throughout the beginning of his, his, his ruling, it says that he was a righteous king. He was following the advice of a prophet, the name of Zechariah was guiding him. But at some point, something got to his head and he decides to offer the ktorit, the incense. And at that point, what do we have happening? We have, Uziyahu receiving leprosy and essentially is sort of dead from that point. He now is no longer functioning as king. He goes into isolation. So he's off the political map. And as we also saw in Yeshayahu, there is also an earthquake taking place. Okay, now an earthquake fits in very nicely with the idea of somebody, Nada Kohen, trying to sacrifice Ktorit, incense, because that is exactly what happened also in the story of Korach, because Korach also was trying to be a queen, also tried to offer incense, even though he was not, and the earthquake occurred in that time also, and the ground swallowing it swallowed him up. Now, Uziyahu does not get swallowed up by this earthquake, but there is this very significant earthquake taking place, and this earthquake also has a message to it. And at this point in time, when this earthquake is taking place, and Uziyahu is receiving this leprosy, and is being evicted from the temple and from his position as king, Yeshayahu is now being consecrated as a prophet, and God is now sending him out with a message uh, to the people, okay? And on that background, we'll have to study, not, to, not tonight, but next time, what is this message that uh, Yeshayahu is being given at precisely uh, this point in time? And this message will be about what went wrong, and what are the next steps? What does the future hold for uh, Am Yisrael, the nation, and the nation of Israel, and the kingdom of Judah at this sort of critical juncture in, in, in the history?
Okay. Anybody have any um, questions or comments? Feel free to unmute yourselves if you do. What is the timeline between Uzia and Shalom HaMelech? I'm interested in the military successes. Was he using the communication, the roads that Shalom HaMelech built to be able to go from north to south and east to west? Yeah, fa fantastic comment. Uziah is very much similar to Shlomo HaMelech in his success. And in some aspects, he was even more successful than Shlomo. Now, we're speaking about quite a good amount of time. In other words, after Shlomo HaMelech, basically most of Shlomo HaMelech's successes uh, were lost and the situation deteriorated. And Uziah was a good, a good number of years later. I don't remember the precise amount of years, but we're talking a good number of kings in between Shlomo Amelech and Uziyahu. Uziyahu restored a lot of the successes of Shlomo Amelech. Like for example, Eilat. Shlomo Amelech built Eilat, but after Shlomo Amelech it was lost. The kingdom of Yehuda did, uh, did not control Eilat until the times of Uziyahu. And a lot of the successes of Uziyahu were very, very similar to Shlomo Amelech. And we'll see this is one of the things that Yeshayahu will speak about. The similarities between the time of Uziyahu and Shlomo Amelech, both on the successes and also on the sins. And there's a, there's a significant parallel between Uziyahu and Shlomo Amelech, and that's one of the issues that Yeshayahu uh, speaks about in, in the first few chapters. Of so Yishayahu. he must have commissioned large numbers of chariots as well. I'm sorry? He must have commissioned large numbers of chariots, which were expensive. It's very interesting. Because this is something we'll study in depth, but it's very interesting. Uziyahu was trying to avoid the sins of Shlomo Amelech, but he wasn't really able to avoid them. In other words, Shlomo HaMelech, we know, transgressed certain prohibitions of the king. And Uziyahu, as we'll see, was sort of trying to cleverly do what Shlomo HaMelech did, but in a way which was sort of would be kosher and not go into the pitfalls of Shlomo HaMelech. But ultimately, he fell into the same uh, pitfalls. So that's, that's you, you hit really uh, uh, the nail on the head. It's, it's a very, um, the, the comparison between Shlomo HaMelech and Uziyahu would be very interesting. And that's, that's going to be a central focus of Yeshayahu in his prophecies on this period. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, please just unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, no, you need to unmute yourself again. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I think you said that uh, there was an extension down to Elat. They Correct. The, is, are there any archeological uh, evidence to support that? Uh, good question. I, I, I'll have to look into that. I don't know. But that's, that's, what it, uh, that, that's what's being described here. That it, it's described regarding Shlomo Amelech that he built up a lot, and again Uziyahu that, that he built up a lot. I wondered if there was any buildings left to uh, support that. I'm not, I'm not, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, find out. I'm not, uh, I'm not a big expert on the archaeological findings, but I know a few people who are, so I'll try to ask him if okay. there's been any, uh, any such uh, diggings in the area of Eilat. Okay. All right, very good. Thank you so much, uh, somebody else as well. Yeah, please go ahead. Just unmute yourselves. Unmute. Uh, hi, Diane. Um, hi. I have a, probably a simple-minded question. Um, when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses, our prophet, asked to see God, God, God's likeness, right. he was told that no, no man shall see me and live. Right. Um, now, now Isaiah is talking about having seen something of the image of uh, the Almighty. Right. How, how are we to understand this seeming discrepancy, please? Yes, this, this is one of the things that I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time examining. How could Yeshayahu come along and say that he saw God? And we know after Moshe, Rabbeinu said that it's not possible to see God. And this is the, um, and actually Chazal tell us that Yeshayahu was put on trial for this statement. How could you say that you see God when it's impossible to see God? And this is something we'll analyze, what that means. Because Yeshayahu is not alone in this. We find a few other prophets in Tanakh who claim that they have seen God. And obviously, Ezekiel, that cannot be. Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel, Ezekiel sort of says it. Amos says it. Uh, there's a prophet, Michayu, in the Book of Kings that claims that he, said, he saw God 
So there are several prophets that claim that they saw God. And this is something that we'll try to study very much in depth. What does a prophet mean when he says that he saw God? Because obviously that cannot be, mean, it cannot be understood literally. Okay, but it's an excellent question, but we'll devote a whole uh, uh, shiur or maybe two just to that question as well. What, what was the relationship between the Northern Kingdom and the Kingdom of Israel at that time? And was uh, uh, Yeshayahu involved in that at all? Did he prophesy for the North as well? Yeshayahu was fo focusing mostly on Yehuda. He wasn't focusing on the North. We will examine that. And we will see, we know that there were periods that they got along and there were periods that they didn't get along at all. As, okay. as we will study later on, during the times of Liao, apparently the connections were very good. We know that by the time of Ahaz, it was terrible and they even went to war against each other. Okay? Earlier, before Uziao, in the times of Uziao's father, Amatia, they also went to war. Okay? So the relations there... Uh, were problematic, there were good times and bad times, and that's, that's one of the things that we'll definitely focus on. Okay, lovely, thank you. Very interesting share. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Good evening. We'll continue uh, next Tuesday, same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.